In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear sisters and brothers, on Palm Sunday, we enter the last part of our long spiritual journey of the Great Lent. With the help of the scriptural readings and the liturgical services of this period, we have followed Jesus in his earthly ministry, listened to his preaching and witnessed his miraculous deeds. At the same time, we were saddened by the opposition and rejection he faced. We have also heard him many times predicting his death on the cross at the end of his earthly journey, and we were deeply moved by his determination to fulfill his earthly mission, although he was aware of its painful ending. He invited us to become his disciples, to imitate his life of sacrifice and commitment to God's will, to carry our own cross and follow him. Now this journey is coming to an end. Jesus' entrance to Jerusalem under the joyous cries of the crowd is not only shadowed by the ominous plans of his opponents, but is also illumined by the hope of victory over death. It leads through the cross to the dawn of resurrection, and it is an open calling to discipleship. The Gospel reading of Palm Sunday includes all these elements. The mixed feelings of joy, hope, fear and sadness, but also examples of discipleship and rejection. It is a passage full of contrasts between the characters of the story and their reactions and of allusions to past events and those that will follow. It comes from John's Gospel from chapter 12 verses 1 to 18 and it could be divided into two parts. The first part play, takes place at the house of Lazarus, Martha and Mary in Bethany, shortly after Lazarus' resurrection. Out of gratitude, Mary anoints Jesus' feet during a meal, an act that would cause Judas' criticism, but also Jesus' praise. In the conclusion of this story, uh, it is noted that not only Judas, but also the high priests were unhappy and were discussing killing Lazarus as well, because he became a reason for people to believe in Jesus. The second story the second part is the story of Jesus' entrance to Jerusalem on a donkey hailed as a king of Israel by an enthusiastic crowd. Jesus' disciples are bewildered by this warm acceptance and again Jesus' opponents, the Pharisees, are disturbed because they understand that it was due to the raising of Lazarus that the crowd welcomed Jesus with joyous cries and hopeful expectation. On the one side there is Mary the, and the crowd who thankfully acknowledge Jesus' authority and praise with gratitude and hope the joyful event of Lazarus' Lazarus's coming back to life through Jesus' powerful work. On the other side, there is Judas, one of the twelve disciples and friends of Jesus, and the high priests and Pharisees, who are not at all happy with what followed Lazarus' rising. They find excuses to minify minimize or even dismiss its significance and remain stubbornly blind to this manifestation of God's glory and mercy. Each of them, Mary, the crowd, Judas and Jesus' opponents, represent typical reactions toward Jesus in John's Gospel and stand out as models of exemplary discipleship or failure to accept Jesus' identity and calling to the eternal life. Mary, for example, is a model of the true disciple. She and her sister Martha express their gratitude to Jesus in their particular way. Martha serves the guests of their house during the meal, but Mary does something remarkable. She anoints Jesus' feet with an expensive ointment and wipes them with her hair. This is an unconventional gesture of hospitality. In ancient societies, Respectable women were not allowed to loosen their hair in public, let alone express their love in such a way to a non-relative. Moreover, washing the feet of their guests was a duty of the servants and slaves. Despite the rules of propriety, Mary anoints Jesus' feet and her deed is not just an expression of her sincere gratitude. Her unexpected gesture has a deeper twofold significance. 
First, it is an astonishing expression of her unlimited love and devotion to Jesus, a silent yet eloquent and direct confession of his divinity. By anointing him with such a quantity of exquisite perfume, a gift suitable for a king or a god, Mary acknowledges Jesus' true identity. He is her Lord, the Son of God. Second, Mary also acts as a prophetic figure. Jesus' defense of her actions provides us with the key to understand the meaning of their meaning. He explains that Mary has kept this perfume for the day of his burial, a day that he has proclaimed but has not come yet. Thus, Mary acts as a prophet and prefers Jesus' body in advance. She turns out to be one of the few and probably the first in John's Gospel to understand the imminent death of Jesus. With her prophetic action then, Mary stands out as a true friend and faithful disciple. In a similar way, the people in Jerusalem also express their devotion and confess Jesus' messianic identity when they hold palm branches and greet him with verses from the Psalms and the Prophets. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel, they cry. They are unknowingly give thus their witness and exhibit a remarkable ability to interpret the events that take place through the scriptures of Israel. However, as the story continues in chapter 12 of John's Gospel, they will be quickly disappointed and will reject Jesus. They accept with joy the miraculous raising of Lazarus and they seem willing to believe and follow Jesus, yet not unconditionally, but only if he fulfills their own political and worldly expectations and hopes. Their willingness and enthusiasm lack any depth and not only they fade out, but they are also replaced by enmity and rejection. Like them, Judas fails to be a true disciple. His stark contrast to Mary's unconditional love and the fact that he was one of the twelve disciples of Jesus, the trusted friend who acted as the group's treasurer but turned out to be a hypocrite and an apostate, highlight this tragic failure. He criticizes Mary's actions and uses the poor as an excuse. However, it is revealed that he is dishonest and indifferent to those in need. In fact, he is a thief who expected the money used for purchasing the perfume to end up in his pocket. He is unable to understand Jesus' true identity or participate in the joy of Lazarus' resurrection. We also read that he will hand Jesus over to his opponents and thus contribute to his death. In a tragic way, both Judas and Mary play a particular role in Jesus' passion and death. Yet Mary, as a firm and devout disciple, exhibits a remarkable insight into Jesus' true identity and faith. Judas, on the other hand, seems to be incapable to understand and embrace the calling to life. Thus, instead of being a true friend, he becomes an enemy and an ally of Jesus' opponents who have already decided to kill Jesus and they are now planning to kill Lazarus as well. Lazarus' resurrection shortly before Jesus' passion and death is a kind of a proleptic reference to Jesus' resurrection, a kind of flash forward in the story, a reassurance and proof in advance that Jesus, the Lord who raised, Lazarus, who raised Lazarus from the dead, will also rise. Yet this resurrection, a manifestation of Jesus' divine authority and power, becomes a stumbling block, a testing of discipleship that not everybody passes. Tragically, Lazarus' return to life is used as an excuse for Jesus' unjust execution. Judas and Jesus' opponents, but even the crowd, fail to understand. They seem to ignore the true meaning of the miraculous event and reject Jesus. They miss their opportunity to become true friends and disciples, and they are eventually lost in the dark night of their ignorance and stubbornness. Mary, however, 
manifests various signs of true friendship and discipleship, humility, an eagerness to show her devotion and love unconditionally and unconventionally, a capability to see and understand the signs and act accordingly, and prove herself a faithful follower of Jesus even to the painful moment of his death. Dear brothers and sisters, my dear friends, the Gospel reading of this Sunday is a calling to us all. It encourages us to reflect upon the various characters of this story and decide what kind of disciples we would like to be. Like Mary, Judas, the crowd, or the high priest and the Pharisees, we will also follow Jesus in the last days of his earthly ministry. We will witness his death and we will hear the joyful proclamation of his resurrection. Yet, it is up to us to find our place in his story. Judas' example clearly demonstrates that it is not enough to be called Jesus' friend and disciple. One can be so close to the light and yet be filled with darkness. Mary, however, stands out as an exemplary disciple, humble and silent, yet brave and steadfast, with unconditional love and prophetic discernment. Let's then experience this week as a unique opportunity to reflect upon our relation to Jesus. Let's accompany him in his passion and celebrate as faithful friends his resurrection. Kali Anastasi.